lots of people are stupid and lots of people are old and lots of people are lazy. You know, we actually don't hand out votes on the basis of how clever you are or any kind of test of intellectual capability. Why should we uh, not di- not give a vote to to people under 18? <laughs> Yes, here we are again. It's How to Win an Election with me, Matt Chorley, uh, joined by uh, Peter Manson. What are you putting? You're putting a face already, Peter. (laughs) Just I need to introduce you. Peter Manson, Daniel Finkelstein and Policy McKenzie. uh, We're all here with a special half term. uh, You uh, answering the questions of our of our many army of listeners. Have you have you have you met any of our army of listeners in the flesh? I met one last night. Did you? I got out of a cab. Uh, last evening, I was going somewhere, and just as I was shutting the door, he said, "Oh, by the way, Peter, love your podcast." Wow! I I, was... I met someone in the lift earlier here at Times headquarters. Yeah, that, that was the chief executive. Doesn't really count if it's somebody <laughs> who works here. Well, but she still <laughs> recognised me. Yeah. Uh, in the lift, she said, "I'm enjoying the podcast." Great. And then it turned out we used to work together, but I didn't remember. Nice. Danny? Well, I've had a lot of it, actually. Oh, I can't good. remember specific incidents now. I'm, the pressure of, the, of it is like it's all gone out of my head. But I'm, I'm really quite very happy with the number well, of people who a friend of seem mine, to be listening. A friend of mine who used to work for me, a very good guy, he said, it's really getting better. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I hate those. They, they, that sound, that's one of those things that sounds like a compliment, but is, in fact, an insult. Has anyone ever said that about your column? <laughs> <laughs> really, really getting better. When you said it was somebody who used to work for you, was it Tony Blair? <laughs> Gordon Brown Gordon. Really did <laughs> well if you want to get in touch with questions uh, you can email us howtowin at thetimes.co.uk and if you see Danny out and about do go and say hello and tell him you like the podcast so he doesn't feel left out uh, now um, let's kick off with because we know that everyone loves the theme tune uh, and we've previously had people who've uh, played it while they've been out doing Christmas carols we had someone who could do the uh, how to win election theme on their head well, now we've had this from Lizzie. Hi, all. This is Lizzie from Manchester. I'm a big fan, especially of Peter. My sister Emily and I have long imagined that O Fortuna will begin to play whenever Lord Mandelson enters a room. But, of course, it's now clear that Peter is a pussycat. I only recently discovered this most excellent podcast, so I'm working my way back through older episodes that I missed. And I just heard a supremely talented gentleman playing your theme tune on his head. So I assume that you would also like to hear me gargling it. Much love. Keep up the super work. So we'd all like to hear Lizzie gargling the How to Win an Election theme, wouldn't we? Really would, yes. Here we go. This has made my day. <laughs> that is fantastic. Um, oh, Lizzie. Well done, Lizzie. I was quite jealous originally when she said that she was particularly fond of Peter, but then when she did that gargling, I wasn't so jealous. <laughs> I think most of your fans are a bit like that, Peter. <laughs> well, if you see Daddy in the street, do go up and gargle at him. Uh, uh, before we do some uh, questions that people have been sent in, it seems that Keir Starman's been listening to the podcast, Peter, because you told him to drop the £28 billion, pounds and now he has. Um, all I know is that it's as well to get ahead of the curve in these matters. If only he had done. <laughs> get ahead of the curves just to explore all that unexploded ordnance that's mm. lurking just below the surface and make sure that it's removed before it goes off on in your face in, in an election campaign. I mean, Great Mandelson principle. Fine, he is still going to become prime minister at the end of the year, but he only had one policy, <laughs> and now he's dropped it. Um, you know, you might have thought it through a little bit before. I, I have been in this position, you know, I accept because the Conservative Party under William Hague advanced the tax guarantee, and then realised it, it wouldn't it wouldn't work. And in those circumstances, the best thing to do is probably to drop it rather than to go into an election doing it. But I think it does raise some questions. Um, which maybe Labour doesn't have to answer to win, but it certainly will have to answer to govern w- w- about what it is that Keir Starmer really thinks and, I, and you know, where he is uh, and where his team is. So, you know, they've You're not going to come old... out with where is the plan, are you, that Sunak line that he... Well, I th- I, look, the reason, they've, every look other... the reason they've come up with that um, question is because they clearly know that that's what the focus groups ask. It's, it's, yeah. it's Labour's 
one weakness, the thing that might soften their vote. In you know, as you know, I think that Labour will win the election. I just said, but I, you know, but I do think that if you're the Conservative Party, of course you'll press on that issue, and that exact phrase comes out of focus groups. So of course they press on it. That's just professional campaigning. Mm. But it's interesting that you know Jeremy Hunt said uh, on Twitter, it, it, well, or whatever it's called, you know, that so we uh, used called Jeremy Hunt. <laughs> Today, but, uh, he said, "Oh, after however many years in opposition, all Labour can do is copy the Conservative Party on economic policy." You think, "Well, hang on, isn't that the Keir Starmer line?" It's it, they've got. That is right that there is that attack that wears the plan, but I think the Conservative Party again is in such a tangle that they've jumbled that up with the only plan you've got is the same as our plan, which is. No plan Not at really all. Not really very actually. scary. It was the same problem with New Labour, New Danger, the campaign in 97. The, the Conservative Party could never, you know, was a lot of the time sort of saying the danger is they're copying us. And you think, well, why is that? Why would that yeah. be a danger? <laughs> so you're right. I think, I think for the Conservative Party to land this, they'd have to be quite disciplined. I think actually, to be fair, because I've been very critical of some of the campaign things that I like, the party conference strategy. They have been pretty relentless about de- about the twenty eight billion, repeating it over and over again. And so, and Labour has under this kind of pressure, it has sort of buckled on it. Um, and though by itself this is not enough to change the to change the election result, it doesn't help Keir Starmer's leadership ratings, which are one of the things that matter. I suspect we'll find it's a it's a rounding error. Most people will not have noticed he had the policy. Most people won't notice that he's abandoned it. But it's certainly. You know, it's not the uh, episode of his uh, opposition leadership who looked back on with the greatest fondness. In the 1980s, uh, when I started off in this lark, I had a rule. I had a rule. This business we call show. (laughs) Politics, campaigns, how to win an election. Um, I had a rule which said, you know, when something happens to you and some great Tory piece of artillery bombardment opens up in front of you and you're momentarily dazed and confused as to you know, how to react to it. I said, if in doubt, say nout, but not for long. And Mr. Starmer and his team seem to have applied half that rule. (laughs) (laughs) If in doubt, say nout, which is right. You can marshal the facts, you work out what your policy is, make sure it's joined up and then nimbly uh, articulate it. But if if you delay, you'll find yourself dragged halfway around the stadium behind the Tory chariot, you know, before you open your mouth. And it, it just looks terrible. So I do agree they were right to take their time to sort out the policy. Uh, I just think it could have been done a little quicker and with a little bit more nimbly. Is there also a question about where power lies in the Labour Party? Because this has essentially come about as a result of a cabinet, shadow cabinet split that You've got Ed Miliband and, and some of the ones who liked the green stuff and thought it was a very important thing, and you've essentially had the shadow chancellor. Who, who, who were they exactly? Let's have their names. <laughs> <laughs> the shadow chancellor uh, and, and her new shadow team, Darren Jones as well, have led the charge on we should drop it. And in the end, Keir Starmer, who only f- a few days before dropping it, went on the radio and said it was, went on Times Radio and said it was desperately needed. It does feel like Keir Starmer's not really in charge of his own. Well, you've always got to hold together a coalition of different opinions. There will always be a chancellor or a shadow chancellor saying we shouldn't overpromise when it comes to spending money, and people representing the individual departments saying yes, we should. <laughs> uh, but because actually, it's much easier to do policy that involves spending lots of money than other kinds of policy about you know regulatory change and structural reforms. All that That's sort of boring, right? Like, yeah. Nobody gets out of bed for that. The twenty eight billion was always quite weird because it's such a strange number <laughs> and 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 of course, what matters is the destination what matters is what it's for, which is green investment and labor is still saying that they are committed to uh cleaning up the power grid decarbonizing the power grid by by twenty thirty and instead of choosing a number and saying we'll spend that, they are going to try and get there leveraging private finance as Peter was talking about. Uh, last time, public finance, whatever it takes in order to get there. Of course, the problem is that you can't guarantee the policy success if you're not willing to guarantee the mechanism. And if those fiscal rules do actually impinge on their ability to uh, achieve their investment goals, then they're in trouble. Mm -hmm. But 
but that none of that's relevant to winning an election. That's about you, how you, you run a country. You, you, can't, you can't. What they've done though is try to abolish the cost of the policy without abol- abolishing the policy. So yeah. I, that, I just don't think. I think that's a little biggest... unfair, Danny. They've decided to go more slowly and not to, for example, insulate well, everyone so as quickly as they said. <laughs> so the, the the amount. So I, I I just think the the other question I would you know I, I'm sure the other rule you would agree with Peter is when you do revisit it you've got to then it's a bit like when you have a scandal you've got to get it all out right and there's no point getting half out I I sort of feel they've got half out from this policy so I I'd be interested to see whether this manoeuvre even works um, and whether. You know, they've actually, in sure. fact, executed a full U-turn. U-turns I, I, are very, very difficult to execute in uh, politics. I, I remember Dennis Healy saying to me in the 1980s, he said, Peter, he was actually talking to Neil Kinnock in front of me, and he said, you know, there's nothing wrong uh, with U-turns as long as you're turning in the direction the public wants. And I think in this case, in a choice between saving their faces on the one hand and Labour's entire fiscal credibility on the other, they've chosen the fiscal credibility. That counts for more with the public. They have U-turned in the direction the public will want. But let's be clear, if you're going to do a U-turn, say it's a U-turn. Don't do a U-turn and then pretend it isn't. As I've got the press release (laughs) here, as they uh, they put out, uh, Labour announces plans to invest in Britain's future. Well, they are going to invest in Britain's future. It's like nothing. But, I thought it was going to say nothing you, has changed. But, but I tell you, but, I t- but nothing has changed, as Theresa May said. But there's a j- difference between public investment and private investment. Oh, well, let's not get bogged down. You know, let, 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 let's not let's not <laughs> dwell on the facts here, Matt. <laughs> let's just gloss over and <laughs> come on. Let's be fair to Ed Miliband. Um, it's a it's a sad it's a sad time for Ed Miliband. Our, our thoughts are with him. Um, <laughs> Okay, let's move on to uh, some questions that uh, listeners have sent in. This is from Tristan. He says, my question is as follows. Following Boris Johnson's victory in the 2019 election, many journalists and pundits spoke of a political realignment as traditional Labour voters voted Tory for the first time. However, with the prospect of Labour now regaining the majority of those seats, how is it? how reasonable is it to call Johnson's 2019 electoral winning coalition a realignment and not just a minor blip in those traditional Labour heartlands. And then he goes on to say, P.S., loving the show, and thank you to everyone's hard work in making it happen, but we don't, we don't want to dwell on the praise. Well, Danny, blip or realignment? I, I think it's too early to tell. Um, I, I, I did think that when they won those seats, you know, one, what the Tory party has been trying to do is win a whole load of new seats and to some extent change its message to achieve that and keep a very wide coalition together. And I always wondered whether that was really possible even though it succeeded against Jeremy Corbyn and with the background of Brexit in 2019 uh, so I, I think that uh, it's too uh, the fact that it's gone back this time is an indication that, that maybe that thesis was correct but I wouldn't be sure once you've loosened the attachment these places have to all, to always being Labour seats it, it they probably won't go back to the exactly the pattern they had before but an awful lot depends on the decisions that are taken now my, my view is in, you know about a hundred years ago um, Baldwin sort of ushered the Labour Party into power usher deliberately so the Conservatives could fight a force that was ideologically and demographically more limited than the Liberal Party in reach and he succeeded in doing that and what we may be about to see is the reversal of that the Tories will win sometimes and sometimes they will get some of these seats back and have a majority but they will not be the natural party of government. That depends, however, on the sort of victory Keir Starmer wins and then how he interprets that victory and what sort of leadership he provides. So I think there are too many questions that we don't know the answer to to be able to to estimate this. Polly? Uh, Nothing is for certain or forever in politics. And, you know, Danny always reminds us that it's leadership that matters we don't know who the next leader of the Conservative Party yeah. will be. You know, we, we, we sort of assume that Rishi Sunak will, will leave office and that there will then be a tussle for the heart and soul of the Conservative Party. Will that result in a leader who tries to put together a coalition which is more like the, the Leave Coalition, which uh, Boris Johnson built up, uh, and take on reform and, uh, uh, I guess, working-class votes, northern votes... Or, or will it be a, a, a leader who wants a more of a one nation direction for the Conservative Party? It, it seems to me that it's that next leader who will create a certain amount of path dependency about 
Should we call it the blippishness of <laughs> Boris Johnson? Uh, Not you know, from blimpishness, which is a sort of <laughs> he's sense quite of, blimpy too. Quite but blimpy. You, like, if 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 you, I mean, basically, if you get another leader of the Conservative Party who's a bit like Boris Johnson, it's more likely that that's where the Conservative Party will move to. And as one party moves into a certain amount of territory, the winning coalition for the other party shifts as well, and so Labour starts to pick up different sorts of votes, different sorts of of voters. If the Conservative Party it moves, you know, to the reform agenda, then there are kind of middle class uh, uh, middle income kind of groups that Labour can probably pick up much more easily What do you think, Hedda? Well, speaking of somebody who once represented a red wall Labour heartland seat in the northeast of the country, I would say that what happened in 2019 was not a realignment, but it was certainly more than a blip and the reason I say it was more oh, than the third way. The re- <laughs> reason I say it was more than a blip is because that sort of movement and fluidity and volatility amongst voters had started in our constituencies long before 2019. I mean, in the 1960s, 50 percent of the electorate would say that they are firmly attached to one party or another. The equivalent question would be answered now by about 9 to 15 percent rather than 50. So, you know, electoral currents and patterns have been completely uh, disrupted. I mean, once upon a time, you could say, well, Labour vote uh, was defined by class and geography to a, to a great extent. That's why we built up all these mountains of votes in, in, in northern England. Um, it, now it's not class. Class identity and solidarity has sort of evaporated uh, amongst uh, voters. Now the differences between voters, or well, their voting patterns rather, are defined more by age and educational uh, qualification, which is why Labour is piling up you know, mountains of, frankly, useless votes in cities and university towns where, you know, the population is now overwhelmingly relatively young and university educated. Uh, But we are losing our foothold somewhat amongst older uh, uh, voters, less educationally qualified, not so much in cities, but in towns. And that's what was reflected in the great... Brexit vote in 2019. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People voted for, you know, two drivers, two reasons in 2019. One was to get Brexit done because they were fed to the back teeth of the whole subject. And secondly, to vote against Jeremy Corbyn, who could, you know, who could be surprised uh, at that. Now, those <laughs> the, those two drivers are no longer relevant. They no longer apply. That's why I think Johnson's coalition has broken up. And that's why we're not going to see a repeat of history. Well, that was a great question, Tristan, to which uh, we took a long time to say we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> right, up next, we're going to have some more questions, including how hard work is a general election? What do the panel think of the civil service? What happens with exit polls? And what did Polly say about us when she went on with Jane and Fee? Uh, we'll do that next on how to win an election. This one is from Brian in Glasgow. Hi, Matt. Big fan of the podcast. Whenever there's a rumour of a snap general election... Journalists seem to get nervous as it will cancel all of their upcoming plans and holidays. So my question is, for those involved in fighting and covering a general election, how much extra work is involved? Is it late nights, seven days a week? Please note, my question is intended to determine how much schadenfreude I should expect to feel during the next election campaign, as I happily listen to how to win an election without actually having to work on one. So, how much work, more work is it from a journalist's uh, or a campaigner's um, uh, perspective? Danny, given that you've done both. Yeah, when I was uh, working for the Conservative Party in 1997, I had to have a flat only a few yards from Conservative Central Office in order that I could sleep somewhere, uh, and that was seven days a week. I went home once because a man... St- st- started ringing my home threatening to kill me um, <laughs> after I'd exposed some Labour policy on <laughs> and been credited with it on television and um, and so then I had to go home uh, but then I came back to the office and I stayed there um, 
you know, round the clock. So it, the, you have these late night briefings that let's say you're working for the prime minister, the prime minister goes out on tour, then you want to brief them when they come back. And then the next morning, these press conferences start, you have to start again. And every, everyone, I would think everyone's doing that. And certainly, um, you know, preparing for the general election, I started to get fit but much fitter than I'd been before just in order to get through it. Uh, it's very important that you get organised, you know, the sort of diet of everyone. I, I remember <laughs> this big thing. We were coming to the close to this massive, massive defeat. But the biggest problem for the party chairman was that the canteen that was serving staff was emitting a very strong smell of sausages <laughs> that, that, that dominated the hall of central <laughs> office and he regarded as completely unprofessional. And I remember passing by, as the, you know, this, we were sort of 25% in the polls and watching Brahma when he talked the air conditioning man through where he thought the sausage smell was uh, coming from. I suppose from. that's what you call, you know, focusing on the things you can control. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Um, this question reminds me, because the thing about cancelling of holidays, because I suppose... We do know there's going to be an election this year, and Rishi Sunak says it's going to be at the end of the year. So it's unlike the last two elections, which have been sprung as to snap elections. And I've just looked it up, and I've only ever described him as a very senior uh, person. But in 2017, I, I found a message. I texted Gavin Williamson, who I think was then, what was he, Chief Whip, and said, if you have an election on May the 4th, it'll ruin my two weeks at Disney World over Easter. And he replied, can I reassure you, your holiday will not be ruined. I will deliver on that promise to you and your family. And I said, no U-turn. He said, it's me making the promise. They are worth more than others. Wow. Ooh. And I was awoken very early one morning while I was in Florida <laughs> to my phone exploding with the news that Theresa May had appeared outside Downing Street and called a general election. And Did I've held it to... against him ever since. Yeah, but to be fair to Gavin Williamson, I always, I, when she came out with her lectern in Downing Street, everyone said she's going to call an election. And I tweeted with great confidence, with the great confidence that led me to this chair in a podcast on how to win an election, as a political pundit, she's not going to call an election. <laughs> and this is because I had an extremely good source. And I won't tell you who the source is, but she was excellent. <laughs> That told me there wasn't going to be a general election. Uh, and how long I, in advance did Theresa say that to you? I, I obviously can't reveal who whether the source was, but it was it was it was before somebody went on holiday that yeah. may or may not know my source. Yeah. To be to be fair to Gavin Williamson, it's going to be a struggle, I think, to get that off the ground as a as a slogan. How much more work is it if you're inside a party politics? It's an extraordinary amount of work. I mean, and it is a twenty four seven operation. Not everybody is there all the time, but there will absolutely be an overnight shift doing media monitoring who will then pass over to the main team who are probably there at five in the morning uh, and there till relatively late. I mean, we, there were the sort of senior team who've got taxis in and out. Nobody uh, in the Liberal Democrats has a flat that they can lend uh, staffers uh, in SW1. So unfortunately, it was more, more of a taxis thing. But, you know, there's... There's food, there's breakfast and then lunch and then dinner because absolutely everybody is uh, working full on. I had a box of Curiously Cinnamons uh, cereal, uh, an excellent cereal, I'm sure you'll agree, on my desk oh, in yeah, 2010. Uh, oh, the Liberal book. Democrats all the cereal. <laughs> <laughs> it, I'll, I'll get you some, Matt. Um, and I, I managed to eat them in like the first two days, whole box of cereal, yeah. just from sort of anxiety and stress. But it's, it's the... Taking the leader and senior parliamentarians on tour is the thing that I think is the most kind of physically exhausting because, you know, it is flights and uh, tour buses that inevitably break down and then somebody has to get in the car. And the logistics of that are just relentless. You have huge teams, mostly of volunteers, sort of people who work, sort of junior people in PR agencies who've been sort of lent to the campaign for a, a few weeks or a few days. And putting together that tour and looking after the campaigners and most importantly your VIPs it's just absolutely brutal and incredibly expensive it's completely grim <laughs> <laughs> grim from start to finish it is so taxing it is so intensive you if you're a, I mean I've only ever worked in a campaign as a director of it as a manager of it I hadn't worked in an election campaign before uh, centrally or nationally and so it was completely new to me in 1987. 
Um, nobody ever thought that we were going to win. We were engaged in a battle to come second. That was the truth. We started that campaign with the Liberal Democrats in second place in two polls. So we were fighting for our survival. The one thing I remember about it is these, wh one was when they were trying to present opinion poll findings and research to me. It was all swimming around in front of my eyes. I had absolutely no interest. This was survival. It's not sort of right. <laughs> and secondly is the exhaustion. You know, you, if, you're, if you're running a campaign, you have to be, th you have to have 360 degree vision of all that's going on around you and you have to work 24-7. No ifs or buts, you have to do that. And I tried during that campaign in 1987 uh, to sleep during the day. There was a sort of cupboard uh, <laughs> in the Labour Party uh, headquarters with a sort of camp bed uh, on it. And, you know, but I couldn't, you know, you, you was, I was so overwrought and it was so demanding and you, you just felt so wretched during the whole thing. You didn't know what was going to happen next. It was really, really difficult to sleep, and I'm a very good catnapper, uh, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, amongst my many other strengths and skills. Explains when he goes um, quiet during the podcast. <laughs> 1997 was a bit different. That was more like a Rolls Royce, uh, and sometimes it could go on to sort of auto drive. No, I mean, and it is. It is obviously easier when you feel that you're going to win. <laughs> So there we go. I think the answer to that, Glasgow, uh, uh, Brian in Glasgow, is uh, lots of schadenfreude is what you're going to have as you watch the election campaign unfold. I, my, in my mind, as a journalist, I always think, well, there's only the same amount of space in the papers, but actually the papers just get bigger and they want it all to be politics. And obviously on the internet, there's a never-ending amount of space. But it'll be interesting to see what, what it's like doing an uh, election on the radio because it's still only three hours. So it just put no, no effort in at all. Right, let's move on to another question. This one sent in by Bev. Hi Matt, Polly, Danny and Peter. We're going to miss you once the general election is over and the moving vans are outside number 10. So perhaps it's time to start planning your next podcast, How to Lose a Government, so you can all stay together. Until <laughs> then, I've got another question for you. What do politicians really think of the civil service? Thanks for keeping us laughing. All the best, Bev. Lovely Bev there with a nice question. What do politicians really think of the civil service? Peter. I like the civil service. I always work very closely with the civil service. I know some people come in as ministers and they're incredibly sort of wary uh, of the unknown. I took exactly the opposite tack. I just assumed that the civil service were my allies before, you know, proven otherwise. And the great thing that civil servants do for ministers is is to prevent them doing stupid things. <laughs> it's really important, which is why Liz Truss went so disastrously wrong. The first thing she did on day one of her premiership was to fire her principal private secretary, fire her national security advisor, and instruct the Chancellor of the Exchequer to fire his permanent secretary. You know, she just didn't want to not take these people's advice. She wanted them out of the room uh, out, uh, altogether. And there was barely anyone left who either could or, you know, had sufficient courage, you know, to tell her and her colleagues, you know, that they were doing dumb things. They were doing stupid it's, things. It's very interesting because uh, one of uh, an MP, well, no, I won't say who it was, but an MP, a, a senior MP, no, it wasn't, um, a senior <laughs> Conservative MP said they'd been having a conversation with Quasi Quateng, and they told me this about three or four days before... Liz Truss became Prime Minister, and, she, and he said Quasi told me he was planning to fire you know, the top Treasury civil servants. And he said, I said to him, do you think that's altogether a wise idea, given that you're going to embark on some quite unorthodox and risky policies, Quasi? And uh, Quasi said, um, I, uh, I hadn't really thought of it like that, so it's a good point, I'll think about it, which he clearly <laughs> didn't. Well, if he did, he was overruled. And what about you, Polly, you're doing policy in Number 10? Because obviously the development of policy and the rollout of it, you can't do single-handedly in the way that sort of bashing out a press release and comms, you can keep to quite a tight political team. No, absolutely. I mean, policy is fundamentally connected to the civil service. But it is worth remembering. You know, when I was a kid, I thought a civil servant was just somebody who had too much time on their hands and could appear on Going for Gold. Because you, like there would always be a thing on quiz shows. It'd be like, I'm Bob and I'm a civil servant. I'd be like, what is that? <laughs> uh, but... 
And the thing is, it could be anything. They could well, work exactly. in the post office. They could that, be a spy. Not a post. Not the post office. Not the post office. If you don't know enough about institutional structures of the post office. I didn't realise the Lib Dems took such a deep interest in the post yeah, office. Yeah, well, you know, it turns out they do. <laughs> but, you know, the civil service is everybody who works in a tax office or in a job centre. It's the people who are staffing the Ministry of Defence sites. Thousands and thousands of people. So w- when we talk about the civil service in political debate, you, you're talking about basically about 5,000 people who really work in policy development directly to ministers. Um I think almost all of them are dedicated, hardworking, totally, uh, totally responsive and flexible to the ministerial kind of democratic direction that they get, um, but also constrained by inconvenient things like reality and money and the law. And and I think what's what's a real shame sometimes is that. Uh, what is experienced by ministers as civil service inertia is just that connection with reality. Yeah. And and instead of being able to trust the civil service to be on their side, as the civil service broadly are, they, 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 they just kind of get angry, take it out on them, and then you start a narrative about who's up and who's down and who's the good guys and who's the bad guys and the blob or whatever it might be. And actually that undermines your ability to work successfully with the civil service. But you do. I think you always do need political advisors, policy advisors, specialist people who can come in and be more of a catalyst. There's something about the permanence of the civil service, which does mean there's there's a preference for inertia, and there's a preference for consistency. And so, especially, I think you know, with a new government coming in, you you do need to be able to leverage quite a lot of change quite quickly. And the habits and the culture and the practices of the civil service just take quite a long time to change. It's kind of a super tanker. Uh, Luckily, Keir Starmer hasn't got any policies left now, so there's no... That's true, that's true. There's nothing nothing that they need to worry about. So he should just appoint, I don't know, me and Peter, maybe Danny as well. We'll just just run everything The government of all the talents. Yeah. Goats. Uh, We've had a couple of questions on a similar theme. So Ben emailed in, said... uh, said, hello, Matt, how to win an election? Well, if you are Labour or other parties on the left, part of the answer is getting more young people voting. I am deeply interested in politics, but I only came to this in my late 30s. How does the panel think we can get more young people engaged in politics? Uh, And then uh, we've had, on a similar note, we've had a voice note from Russell. Oh, hello. I was wondering what the panel (laughs) thought about the under 30s voter um, and how they're going to vote in the next 12 months. Um, I work a lot in the education sector and for the past 10 years I've, I've chatted to students and they seem to have only known um, a Tory government, Brexit, lockdowns, a lot of uh, kind of eye-watering corruption and I can never really fathom where they're going to go um, and I'd be interested to know what the panel thought about that. Thank you. You know, there's a received wisdom amongst many in politics that chasing the youth vote is as a fool's errand, that you're just chasing after fool's gold because at the end of the day, they don't vote. And many don't, but I think it's a very dangerous stereotype uh, for politicians to parties uh, to, to adopt. Uh, I think that uh, we don't actually give young people a very good deal in this country. Where most of our policies, our resource allocation, our national health service are all skewed in the direction of looking after older people. Youngsters can't get on the housing ladder anymore. It's not even a first rung for many of them. Housing is in such short supply. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we can't just say, well, young people aren't interested. They're not going to vote. So we'll just, con- just continue to pursue uh, the older voter. I think that would be a disaster uh, for the country. I do think one interesting thing that's happening, by the way, that I was reading about the other day, is that there's a growing divergence between the voting habits of young women and young men. Uh, young women, over the last decade, what's developed is a pattern of, uh, of voting in which young women are more progressive, they've been on a more sort of liberalising journey, perhaps it's a bit of me too, I don't know what, uh, they tend towards you know, the Green Party or whatever, and that young men, particularly young white men, uh, are not on this liberalising journey you know, to the, in, in, in the same way or to the same extent. Indeed, there's a, there's a sort of growing tide of resentment uh, amongst young men and that they're actually turning, leaning more towards 
you know, Reform UK. They're going more towards the right. And I was very struck, somebody saying to me the other day, uh, that in the United States there's a l large, surprising proportion of young people who are voting for Trump. So something is happening amongst young people uh, and something may be happening between young men as opposed to young women and it could develop as quite an electoral phenomenon. I'm just going to say something that you probably will all think I'm joking but I'm deadly serious which is that I think people should get votes from birth. I think there is no good reason to disenfranchise the under 18s at all. And I, I would be happy for parents to hold that vote in proxy until their child is, say, 10. Uh, but the fundamental reality is that... Just to influence the agenda, you mean, so to, that we're voting the, in the interests of young people as well as older people. The, there is this, just this, there is about 11 million people who can't vote because they're under 18. And that skews what the democratic system represents. The democratic system is literally only capable of of representing the views of the over 18s and the views of the over 18s about young people. And actually, I think that a uh, radical suggestion that anyone who is a citizen of this country should be entitled to be represented in the kind of the demographic balance of where the, where the votes lie would be transformative. And it, it, sure, some people would vote just the way their parents voted and look, Lots of people just vote the way their wife votes or the way their husband votes. Or, and lots of people are stupid and lots of people are old and lots of people are lazy. You know, we actually don't hand out votes on the basis of how clever you are or any kind of test of intellectual capability. Why should we uh, not, di not give a vote to, to people under 18? I just... Okay. So I, I, I have uh, favoured votes for 16-year-olds. Um, Coward. There's always a thin line between courage and stupidity. <laughs> That's what I meant to say. Uh, the, 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 the truth is that the, the problem with your proposal is there's one thing that that whole group of people would share in common, and it isn't, you know, intelligence or insight, or whatever, but they're all dependents. So you would be um, shifting the electoral mass heavily away from taxpayers and working people towards dependents. Um, and so are pensioners. Yes, that's true. I'm just saying you, you'd be adding yeah. to that issue. Um, and I think that that's a problem uh, because I think that, you know, that people do vote for their interests. And if you if you overweight the electorate so that it consists of large numbers of people determining the tax and benefit system, most of whom are beneficiaries rather than taxpayers, you will, um, you could easily go bankrupt quite quickly. Is the answer instead to take the vote off pensioners? I wouldn't want to do that. I mean, there was, during the uh, the sort of worst of the Remain campaign or the post-Brexit post, post Brexit Remain... Bit. Well, do you know, afterwards, when when everyone's like, oh, let's just pretend this didn't happen and move on. And they said, oh, but it's good because all of the Brexit voters are dead already. And it got all a bit unpleasant. And people started to suggest that because young people had voted to stay in the European Union, old people had voted out. Somehow old people, sh I don't know, that you should weight their vote by life expectancy, you know, and or just or just take the votes away from them uh, on the basis of how many minutes they had left to live. It just... In the end, we're all equal. We're all people. Maybe we should give taxpayers two votes, Danny. Okay, so here's another. There's an, there's another probing this uh, question. So if the argument for vote, people, young people voting, is that you know, every aspect of the electorate ought to be summarised, what about the fact that there are lots of people yet to be born who have votes, uh, who who require votes in order that we protect the future? This is great. You know, so Absolutely. What, yeah. what I'm saying is that. You know, you know, well, I think give them the vote. You need to give the them, reason. The, the reason the why you. Well. The reason well, why no. you have to. Why you had to say you'll laugh at me before putting Polly, together. Don't, which, don't by the way, by the way, ghosts. No. You know, by the way, was <laughs> by the way was a thought provoking. Don't be goaded, Polly. We did not, really well. We, we we didn't. You thought we were going to snigger at the beginning, and we didn't. And oh, now I'm not, now I'm advocating votes okay. for ghosts. So I, I'm just <laughs> you are ludicrous. <laughs> whether I well, was, I actually fully disagree with you. I think it's an interesting thing. I think thing. Danny has a really important point that you know uh, builds on the theory of effective altruism and the idea that in fact we should be considering uh, future generations. Wales did an interesting thing. You know, we have an older persons commissioner, a young persons commissioner. Is actually in Wales they had a future generations commissioner, who uh, made the case for and intervened on policy issues in order to protect those unborn. Um, because 
that is different from the dead, Matt, due to the linear nature of time, right? <laughs> it, it is not possible, I'm afraid, for me to affect the quality of life with the yeah. decisions I make today of your great grandma. Wow. I'm afraid. So that's until she's we get a time dead. machine. The only thing that Polly it's left over. out was otters. Right? <laughs> so. <laughs> What about sentient beings no, who aren't team human? human. Well, they team could, human. Okay, but the, the, the no, truth is, you know, people, maybe my dog could vote because my, nope. we can obviously vote. Oh, could, I could get on board with votes for dogs. <laughs> dogs should definitely have a vote. This is what where... I'm trying to say is you do yeah. need, basically, you do need a degree of common sense to intervene at some point. And I suspect it intervenes at below the point. Right, I'm going to be you, that common sense right now and intervene. Because <laughs> I think you made an interesting point and we've completely belittled it. And I think we should probably turn, move on. You didn't belittle it. I think mm-hmm. I proved my point, okay, and nobody fine. is giving votes to ghosts. Ghost dogs. <laughs> I think I appear to take it very seriously. Yes, Thank you, you did. Thank you very much. You. I appreciate that. Right, let's move on. Here is a question from Lion. Hello, Matt, Peter, Policy, and Daniel. Long time <laughs> listener, first time voice recorder. I'm Ryan from the Tory Lib Dem battleground of Yeovil, and I now live in the Tory safe seat of North Dorset. The question for the podcast is in relation to exit polls. What happens when they come in? What is the HQ responses? Do you get any a word beforehand? I would really love to know. Keep up the great work and uh, yeah, hopefully I will hear from you soon. Thank you, Ryan, a good West Country listener. Who wants to talk about exit polls? Because some of you must have been on air when they come in. Two minutes before the 2019, I was sitting in a room. There was just three of us, myself, Pretty Patel and John McDonnell. And I thought, I'm going to watch the exit poll with these people. That would be great, great fun. And then just at the last minute, they got whisked into the studio and they heard it in there while I sat in the waiting room. On your uh, own? Yeah, on my own. So it wasn't quite the <laughs> best. And then Mark Francois came in just to complete the picture. But the, um, <laughs> they, they are, I mean, those exit polls. Danny's that, definition of great fun. Yeah. Uh, he's doing a lot of work there. The, they are amazing moments, those, when you when you watch them. Particularly since they've become so incredibly accurate. Because don't forget, in 92, when they came in, um, it wasn't, they weren't as accurate. You know, it was wrong, actually, the 92 um, exit poll. So, but since, you know, 2010, so I was I was um, in in ITV with Owen Jones and Phil Collins, various other people when the, when the 2015 exit poll. For the benefit poll. of the tape, uh, Peter just grimaced at the, <laughs> the, 20, uh, the 2015. I'm not sure it was the mention of Owen Jones or Phil Collins. <laughs> the 2015, <laughs> the 2015 uh, result, you know, it, exit poll came and of course that was actually an underestimate the conservatives mm. did better but it was it was out of line with where people thought it would go although actually not in fact funnily enough where phil collins had thought it would go he thought that would happen my most unnerving exit poll was before 92 it was in 87 and i was uh, in my uh, office on polling day seven o'clock at night telephone goes and it's a very well-known bbc journalist can i name him uh, yes, I can. The late Vincent Hanna, who was a great sort of election sort of guru and by-election king, and he phoned me and said, Peter, she said, uh, it's Vincent here. And I said, oh, hi, Vincent. He said, how are you? I said, oh, I'm fine, thanks very much. I was feeling absolutely just like death. He said, are you sitting down? I said, Yes, I wasn't actually, I was standing up, but I thought we might hurry along this conversation. Another, <laughs> <laughs> Another piece, piece of spin. And uh, he said, um, Can't believe anything. I think it may be time for Plan B. I thought, God, what the hell is Plan B? Scratching my head. And he said, um, We've had an early inkling uh, of the uh, exit poll, and it looks as if it could very well be. Tories lost their majority, a hung parliament, and Neil Kinnock could be going to Buckingham Palace tomorrow morning. And I said, Vincent, whatever you do, please don't mention this to Neil, (laughs) because (laughs) the disappointment is going to be crushing. I can assure you, he won't be off to Buckingham Palace tomorrow. If we're very, very lucky, we've come as a reasonable second. He said, well, we'll see. Dust down Plan B. Wow, and you were you were right, of course. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but 
<laughs> well, I mean, it was it, it, pretty obvious, wasn't yeah. it? I mean, we knew what was going on on the ground. I think at the core of the question is, you know, are, are we experiencing this as kind of political campaigners in live time with normal human beings at home on their sofa? To which the answer is yes. I mean, you, do, you don't know what it is until... Mm. until it's there and and certainly in the hold on Polly unless you're a conservative because George Osborne I gather has admitted that on two occasions they oh, had really? forewarning uh, of the Which uh, word? Uh, exit really? poll I think apparently 2015 perhaps I don't know what the other one you didn't tell I mean I, I'd be <laughs> surprised with that it's it certainly in 2015 you know our, our expectations as the Lib Dems was that we were going to lose quite a lot of seats but Nowhere near as many. Well, Paddy as Ashton famously said he'd eat his hat. He did say that he would eat yeah. his hat. I think he then did. He then eat like a chocolate hat, a chocolate or hat, or a pasty hat, which or is some cheating. Sort of, it's not a hat, surely. Yeovil hat, because he should. said. Oh, in fact, yeah, Yeovil. Yeah, yeah. right, that's where the question yeah. came from. But never promised to eat a hat. Don't promise I mean, to eat a hat. That's that's just basic politics, right? <laughs> 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 we ticked off a lot of things there. Um, Dog uh, votes for ghost dogs and don't <laughs> eat hats. Uh, right, well, let's finish off there because apparently there are other podcasts, not just our podcast, How to Win an Election. There's also a podcast called Off Air with Jane and Fee. Uh, Jane, Jane Garvey and Fee Glover, who are on Times Radio in the afternoons. And they booked a high-profile guest to go on and discuss their work. And uh, that person was asked, because they work at a university when not doing this other job, and it was asked, do the young people take an interest in politics? Would they know? Do they listen to how to win an election? The young people that this person works with. And this is what they said. So I expect there are lots of people who have enough political history to know that they really, really hate Peter Mandelson and others who might deeply love him. Are you enjoying doing the podcast? I it am. It sounds like you are. Yeah. It's Well, it's lovely. Um, uh, I think... I think Peter it considers me an oddity. Um, How does that manifest itself? Well, he just sometimes looks a bit surprised when I tease him. He thinks of me as a very young creature. I'm not very young. I'm in my mid-40s. But nevertheless, to, a, a, I guess, no, what's, what's the male version of a grand dame? I don't know, but that's what he is, isn't he? Y you obviously know a lot more ra radio than I do, but, like, people who talk over each other are really annoying. And so finding a way to elbow your way into the conversation without interrupting or being the shouty one is genuinely difficult. I think, you know, Matt Chorley does a great job. He's brilliant at trying to remind us to, you know, make space for the other. I think Peter and Danny have such amazing stories. And also they live in a different world from me. They have dinner parties with all sorts of famous people. And I, I don't, but... That's okay. I don't mind being the also ran. Matt Chorley does a great job. He's brilliant. Matt Chorley does a great job. He's brilliant. Matt Chorley does a great job. He's brilliant. <laughs> some sort of some sort of fault. Oh, oh, oh no, 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 that's literally how it went down. <laughs> <laughs> Ghastly sucking up to Matt. Anyway, Polly, do you want to come to dinner? <laughs> well, we definitely want to go to Danny's house. He thinks an idea of fun is John McDonald and Pretty Patel. <laughs> <laughs> You're telling me, Matt Chorley. Yeah. That if you were to, you would not find it fun to watch the election night poll, no, you're exit fine. poll, you're in right. the same room as Pretty Patel and John McDonald. <laughs> John McDonald. Same, of course you of would. Of course you would. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember being here when the 2017 Times Radio Towers, uh, where when the 2017 exit poll dropped, and everyone in the room just sort of let out an involuntary noise and then fell about laughing because it was the one that showed that Theresa May had yeah. gone to all this trouble and lost yeah. her majority. And it was just... I was it was the one that Every, ruined my Disney World holiday. Everyone was surprised at that at that outcome, but I, I if, at the beginning of the Danny. campaign, they're no, at the beginning, Danny. no, at the beginning of the campaign, because well, nothing changed, nothing no, wait, changes, nothing the makes a difference. Campaign, I would have been completely <laughs> surprised by it, yeah. but not by the end of the campaign. I thought by the end of the campaign, it was, it was kind of funny. obvious that that was a very likely thing. By the end of the campaign, yeah. um, because of what had happened, it so was I was a bit, funny. I was a bit surprised. People thought that that was, you know, were, were amazed by it. I was. I thought it was just a confirmation of what we'd begun to appreciate, which was a big, you know, which was a big and unprecedented move in, the, in an election campaign. So the big test then of your appearance with Jane and Fee is, are there any listeners at your university who listen to How to Win, who should now come up to you and tell you all about it? What? It's a good test. Well, because they asked you, does anyone at your university listen to How to Win and you didn't seem oh, I very see. confident? Well, I, I, I so, this, so this I is a test now. I, some of my colleagues do. Oh, but the, I mean, the question was about, you know, 
the young people. The young people. They've probably got better things to do. They're probably on TikTok. Um, I'm sorry, that was not a slur. (laughs) A slur to podcasting or live radio, which obviously I profoundly love. Yeah. Uh, But maybe we need to get Peter on TikTok. But the real objective. The whole new generation. The real objective was to reach women. Yeah. Women. Uh, because like Fee and Jane, that is my demographic. Like all of my sort of friends, my university friends are like big lovers of that amazing podcast and community. And and I think those people should also love politics. Yeah. So yeah, I'm trying to be a bridge. That's what we're here for. We love Jane and Fee. I had a lovely couple of weeks ago. We had uh, we went out for cocktails. Oh my god. Yeah. I'd rather have that than dinner with Going John McDonald. Way, yeah. You could definitely could not have broadcast the conversation we had. Uh, right, let's finish off then. One final uh, uh, question, comment. It's, it's a, this is a proper, more of a comment than a question. Uh, this is from Hannah from Pinner. Do you know her, Danny? Probably, yes. <laughs> I think I do know who that is. Says, hi, <laughs> Matt. Hi, Hannah. Hi, I'm Matt. Peter, Polly and Danny. In my, because we were talking about the bromance between David Cameron and Nick Clegg and putting oh, together yeah. an IKEA cabinet. In my husband's speech at our wedding, he declared that he knew we were right for each other when we were able to build a piece of IKEA furniture together without fighting or wanting to kill each other. So I think Nick Clegg helping David Cameron with his IKEA furniture is a perfect example of their bromance. Love the podcast, as do the A level politics students I teach. Okay. Oh, then I do know who it is. So that's Russ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know Nick Clegg, and I do not believe for one second that he is capable of building a piece of IKEA. <laughs> I, no, no. There's that's only one way to find out. I, 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 so, yeah. I, 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 all, I cannot actually vouch for Nick Clegg's involvement in it, but I can vouch for the fact that David Cameron built them. Uh, I was... There, he showed me them just after he'd finished them, uh, and I, because I remember that when people at that point were saying that he was about to call another election, um, because he would then to get, and I said, well, you know, I've just been in his flat and he's building, he's putting in bookshelves, so I think it's unlikely he's preparing to leave uh, Ten Downing Street very quickly. Um, so I, I think um, I can vouch for that. I cannot vouch for Nick Clegg's involvement. Did you ever help Gordon put together any IKEA furniture, Peter? Uh, no, I helped him on one or two occasions to put together a cabinet uh, Ooh, of a different oh. sort. Got a few loose nuts in those as well. Uh, <laughs> I have to say, Hannah's test of being that uh, being able to put together IKEA furniture without fighting or want to kill each other is a test of a good marriage. I mean, by my experience, no one would be married if that was um, the uh, the test you had to pass. Well, that was a lot of fun. I think we covered a lot of ground there. If you want to send in more questions, email howtowin at thetimes.co.uk, howtowin at thetimes.co.uk, or if you just want to tell us that you're enjoying the podcast. Don't forget, if you see Danny in the street, do gargle at him. Uh, if you are a student at uh, Polys University, tell her uh, um, that you listen to the podcast. And if Peter tells you he's sitting down, he's almost certainly not. Uh, thanks so much for listening. I'll be back to you. This was How to Win an Election. Mm-hmm.